Okay, so I titled this presentation, um, How Did This Happen and What Am I Doing? Uh, because of my position of being in graduate school right now, I'm really kind of at this point of an emerging artist. I wouldn't say that I'm fully established by any means, uh, but I have done a few things here and there. Um, first off, of course, I do want to say thank you to Stony and Open Air and uh, of course, um, Western Montana Creative Initiatives and uh, Molly for always helping out too. Um, Home Resource has been really amazing and a great space to work, so thank you Carly. And also I want to say thank you to Ben for helping me so much in the wood shop as well. Um, I've also been working part-time at the School of Art, so I do want to extend a thank you to Julia Galloway and uh, Jason Clark for helping me in there as well and getting me set up in their sculpture department. And of course, uh, I wouldn't be here without the support of my family and friends, so I just want to thank them because hopefully they'll all watch this later online, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, okay, so quickly, uh, a little background about me. I was actually born in Atlanta, Georgia, um, but I moved around quite a bit as a kid. I ended up spending most of my life uh, here in Jacksonville Beach, uh, Florida. Ignore this little house symbol that is not where I grew up. I did not grow up in a beachfront condo. This is a stock image. Uh, this is all I could find that was like a good picture um, of the beach. So <laughs> yes, it's very nice, but not my home. Uh, I thought this was really nice to kind of show uh, also just like the marshland that I was surrounded by as well as the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this map is also really helpful and very relevant to the work that I'm doing now. Uh, you'll see, let's see did, does the mouse come up here? No. Okay, so um, this will be easier. Just point, point and show. I grew up kind of over here. Jacksonville's a huge city. Um, so I grew up over here at the beaches. Uh, this is the intercoastal right here, which we also call the ditch. Uh, a lot of people didn't cross the ditch if you lived on the beach. Uh, There's maybe a little separation of the townies over there. Uh, but, you know, I went to school over here, over the ditch at University of North Florida. Um, this is the St. John, John's River here that runs through the city. Downtown is over here, so it's like 45 minutes big old city uh, to drive across. But uh, I thought that would be great and I'll kind of reference back to this. Um, at UNF, I began as a communications major. Um, that's what my dad told me to do, so that's where I started. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something creative though, so eventually I just told my parents I was gonna do graphic design because it felt like the most logical uh, creative fields that I could think of, uh, but after one intro class, I knew it just wasn't for me. So um, at the same time I was doing that, I took a intro to sculpture class as an elective. That was the only reason it fit into my schedule. Uh, there was no, I had no um, major sculpture experience before this class, uh, and to be honest, I was much more concerned with going to the beach and, and drinking. I was in my early 20s, so, you know, so school wasn't really my priority. Uh, but the last project of the semester for this class was learning how to make a two-part mold. Um, and this was so that we would have something to pour for the end of the semester iron pour. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting into, but I did the bare minimum for this this mold making experience. Uh, prior to the pour, the week before, we spent uh, sledgehammering apart old bathtubs into uh, Dorito sized chips, breaking apart Coke, which is like a more porous coal, um, holds heat longer into like tennis ball size, uh, and did a bunch of other things that I didn't exactly understand, but the advanced students told me to do it, so I just did it. <laughs> Uh, got to the pour, and um, honestly, I was annoyed to be there. It was a Saturday class requirement. I was very upset. A bunch of my friends had gone surfing a little north, and I was 
jealous that I couldn't be there. Uh, but I am the type of person that kind of goes with the flow and will make the best of it. Plus, I really enjoyed uh, some of my classmates, even if they were townies. I liked them. <laughs> Um, there was a dress code and a lot of safety concerns to go over. We then had a, a minute to kind of sign up for different jobs that you could do throughout the floor. Uh, I tend to be a very literal person sometimes, so my professor said, sign up for all of them. So I did. Uh, that included fire crew, being part of a floor team, uh, a spotter, or uh, focusing on working the furnace. Um, I love this picture because it, it is so telling of where I was at school. It says get gnarly on the <laughs> furnace there. So um, I do also want to point out this time that I took the class. I had never even used a drill before. Like barely a screwdriver. I was so not handy. I did not understand uh, anything really in that field. So um, I, I also was Maybe, you know, coming to this floor a little salty from jumping in the ocean right before, getting to campus, a great hangover cure, back before hangovers were as painful as they are now. Um, and then someone's looking at me and saying, hey, do you wanna uh, work around this furnace that's like 3,000 degrees and then pull, <laughs> pour molten hot iron into tiny little holes down this walkway? And I was like, yeah, sure, sounds right. I'll do it. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is awesome because this is a photo of me pouring iron for the first time and the crew that I did it with. Uh, and it's also a photo of, of course, the moment where my entire life changed and a whole new path really opened up. Um, I changed my major the following week and withheld that information from my parents for about a year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So this process of making molds and uh, pouring iron is what influenced me to become a sculptor. So I'm going to show a few images of mold making. Um, these are some molds of twigs that I made. It took me a while to kind of find my footing and figure out uh, really what art was and how I wanted to approach it um, and, and all the, the possibilities with it. Uh, but at least now I understood that my brain worked three-dimensionally, uh, and so that was a really exciting discovery. Um, so this photograph here shows when all of your molds are, uh, your sides are all made, you take them apart, and this is a graphite and denatured alcohol solution that we mix and paint onto the empty space where your pattern once was. What this does is prevent burn-in, which burn-in is just kind of like a a hot spot that can happen and create like a not very nice looking textured area of, of your your um, cast piece. Yeah, so I got really into the mold making thing here. So this is just a, a few of the molds I made for one of the following floors. Um, and of course I wanted to melt down some more bathtubs and use, use the really big sledgehammer again. That was really fun. <laughs> Lot of aggression out there. Um, so this photo is of the twigs being poured. Uh, I happened to make these things giant uh, because again I was just learning the mold making process. I did not do this the smartest way possible but I uh, had to get a couple uh, center blocks to stand on and some tall people to, to pour. Um, and then of course there's me standing next to my molds after they're poured after a very long and hot Florida iron pour, uh, hoping that these thin little twigs came out. Not visible in these photographs would be the blanket of humidity that is just <laughs> like wrapping you <laughs> right there. Um, and they worked. So this was really exciting. Um, these were the first things I made that I didn't melt down again later, right away. <laughs> so this was a, a big piece. Uh, a big amount of work for me. Uh, you'll see here these things that are kind of sticking off the side. Those are called whisper vents. And um, those are helpful for like when you pour the iron in, the gases need a place to escape to. Uh, so that just, especially with something that's thin um, and kind of fragile like these twigs, works really well um, and helps with that. 
So uh, this was the finished piece. Uh, eventually it was kind of like a series of work. Um, my siblings and I played outside a lot as kids, so I naturally just gravitated towards uh, twigs and branches and bark, whatever I could find. Um, and at UNF, the sculpture studios had these really big bay windows, which dragonflies would fly in, but not be able to figure out their way out, uh, which led to a collection in my little studio space. And so I decided to use their, uh, their wings as a material. Uh, this branch is also cast iron. Um, so I started kind of pairing this delicate dragonfly wing uh, wings with this heavy, you know, burdensome type material, metal. Um, and this was influenced by sort of this socially constructed idea of femininity uh, within this other socially constructed idea of a man's world um, in, you know, this casting boundary work. Uh, but we did way more than just casting in this program. Uh, we, I was very lucky to have many opportunities created by my professor, Jenny Hager, and her partner in life and sculpture, Lance Vickery. They were married and ran the sculpture department at UNF. Um, and we got to build a lot of large-scale sculptures. So this is me actually learning the logistics of sculpture and having to cut my sculpture in half in order to fit it on the trailer. <laughs> Uh, to uh, bring over to Kentucky, and that is me welding it back together. Um, so this was a transformational learning opportunity. It was a class that was created in partnership with Josephine Sculpture Park in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, we began the class at UNF, and then, like I said, some of us had to cut them in half and move them on a trailer over to Kentucky. Uh, we learned a lot about installation, of course, logistics, and uh, building large scale. Um, and also safety, uh, thinking about people being in public around these sculptures. Um, so here I was playing with line um, and light and shadow, and kind of exploring how the sunlight would come through this work. And, um, it is large enough for people to walk in and kind of look up at the sunlight. Um, the next opportunity was to create a work for a new sculpture park that was um, being built in Jack's Beach. Uh, and this is where I really learned how to create a maquette and then present it to a committee um, who would later vote on which artists would uh, be provided the funding to, to build these works. So um, here I am hurricane proofing uh, this work because it was one block away from the beach. Uh, so again, another lesson in safety. And um, what you'll see too with the maquette is it's really just like a 3D sketch. Um, so if you notice the blue specifically uh, in the final piece, you'll see that it's much more developed into these sort of floral uh, pieces here. So um, this was a really fun and difficult, very definitely a challenging sculpture. Uh, it, at its tallest, it's about 14 feet high. At its widest point, it's about seven uh, feet wide. Um, yeah. And so uh, at the same time that I was working on that sculpture for the beach, I was also working on this commission for a bike rack that is a permanent sculpture on UNF campus. Again, creating a maquette um, and presenting to a committee and also understanding uh, budgeting, how to order metal, how to prioritize uh, what materials you're going to use, what thickness of metal is best for something that's going to be 15 feet long, 6 feet wide, and just under 14 feet high. Um, this is kind of like an abstraction of trees, and again, I was playing with light and shadow. Um, you can kind of see uh, how the shadow uh, hits the ground over here. Uh, we kind of started had a uh, had a running joke, I guess, uh, in the the department that we need to start paying measurements on the walls. So I would understand what I was proposing. So I kept making these extremely large sculptures uh, and not realizing, like, oh yeah, 14 feet's pretty high. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, but luckily, we had this big gantry and plenty of ladders. 
Uh, after I graduated from UNF, I stuck around Jack's Beach for about a year, um, and I worked for a nonprofit robotics company called Renaissance Jacks. I worked with my friend Mary Radcliffe, who also graduated from UNF at the same time, and we sort of worked on like the industrial side um, of, of that company. Uh, and we worked for a local sculptor named Dolph James. Uh, those are some of his chairs that, uh, that he designed, and we would kind of do the, the fun grunt work. Um, and of course, I also served tables and did a little bartending here and there, too. Uh, that same year, I was given the opportunity to build a furnace with a couple of friends uh, for an iron pour wedding performance that uh, would take place at the International Conference of Contemporary Cast Iron Art and Practices in 2018. Uh, this took place in Scranton, Pennsylvania. A couple that I went to school with actually got married <laughs> at this iron pour. Uh, one of the girls got officiated and they had a real full, full wedding. Um, so you'll see the furnace here in white. This actually white piece is like a cover that slips on. We built it to look like a cake. Um, and uh, we named it the mistress. <laughs> so after that year, uh, my partner and I decided, uh, let's get out of Florida and do some traveling. So we went and worked to Summer Season at Glacier National Park. And that was my first time uh, visiting Montana. We were evacuated due to wildfires, but we weren't ready to go back to uh, Florida just yet, so we decided to go and work a season in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, uh, which uh, that was also eventful. A couple of Florida kids in a Colorado winter was an experience. We were constantly made fun of by the Minnesota, our Minnesota uh, managers, but we made it. <laughs> um, during that time at Steamboat, I was applying for graduate school, and uh, I really wanted to return to what I was passionate, um, passionate for most, of course. So I applied all over, and I really, uh, I was lucky to have a few options, and I kind of struggled on uh, what part of the country to go to, but I decided to ultimately return to my roots in the South. And so I went to Louisiana State University, where I am currently. Um, so yeah, I came back to a place where the humidity engulfs you, Spanish moss is hanging from the trees, the mosquitoes are swarming, and you stop for gators crossing the road. Uh, and I got back to work. A big convincing factor was my friend Mary that I mentioned earlier. She was already at LSU, and um, she had said, hey, come check it out and, and see what you think. And uh, her and I just work really, really well together. I call her my uh, partner in sculpture. So uh, I grabbed the mistress and I moved all my stuff to Baton Rouge and uh, this is actually that same furnace but without the cake um, topping on it. Uh, the first thing we did was we jumped right into having an iron pour um, at a festival at a local museum in September and the keyword here is September in Louisiana. Um, that's still 90 degrees. It is still very hot and it was a terrible decision. Uh, a lot of things went wrong, which is also just part of sculpture, I think. Um, so what was supposed to be a morning pour ended up being a midday to afternoon pour. So we hit the 90s uh, temperature outside. And basically what Mary and I did was successfully discourage all the students who had never poured iron before to never want to do it again. Uh, it was it was visible. <laughs> it was it's pretty bad. Um, they all lived though. We were fine. No heat exhaustion, actually, surprisingly. Uh, so I was a little rusty from being out of the studio, um, and I began kind of returning to exploring uh, light and shadow, but adding a little more repetition and movement with the ceramic installation. Um, I also took an independent study with a landscape architect who encouraged me to. Uh, respond to the site without having prior plans to the work. So um, that's where this Fern Andy Goldsworthy inspired piece came from. Uh, grad school is all about experimentation. So I decided to use wet clay as a medium and um, I recorded this kind of solo performance where I would walk through the, the clay, which sort of um, was also a response to environment in a way. Uh, had that tactile feeling of uh, that uh, the grounds underneath the muddy waters of the Mississippi. 
So um, using those prints that were left on the fabric, I again played with light and shadow, kind of pulling the, the fabric off the wall and experimenting a little bit there. Uh, I also just happened to see this image of an Amazon lily pad, which I found really striking and interesting. And so uh, why not learn a new tool of a CMC plasma cutter and the programming that goes with it? So I decided to cut this uh, this out of steel. It's a four by four, about a four by four um, lily pad. And then playing again with light and how sunlight affects something, I made these uh, cyanotypes using that that steel cutout. Um, so grad school uh, creates all sorts of feelings and questions about what you're doing with your life and uh, what direction you want to go in your work. Um, I started creating these personal assignments in my studio, basically making like three-dimensional collages uh, using found objects and organic material that I just collected outside. Um, these were a way to kind of explore color, form, and materiality, and uh, it led to, while I was sort of examining the ephemerality of plants as a material, it led to um, my engagement with preservation of those plants. So pressing them, uh, pressing the flowers, and using the dried organic material in, in a different way. Um, my interest in researching environmental issues, uh, ecology and biology, has really shaped my vehicles for observation, uh, which is also how I generate data for myself. I'm a very visual person. Um, and so uh, through this collection and handling of organic material, I began to focus uh, on humanity as nature. And uh, the comparison of veins between the Amazon lily pad and the human body really opened up this different type of inquiry. Um, although humanity as nature feels really obvious, uh, the advent of science and technology has led to this sort of cultural separation um, from the earth in many ways. So I started exploring our vital components of life um, and it, it shifted my research a little bit uh, from using just organic materials to really exploring how to represent the human body as well. Uh, at the end of my second semester of school, I took a class called Looking at Louisiana. Um, we went to different sites and learned about the complex history of the state, uh, cultural tra traditions, politics, contemporary environmental issues, and we met a variety of extremely passionate people um, that just taught me so much about the state. I had no, I had never even visited before. Uh, so this class is where I learned about the deteriorating, excuse me, deteriorating marshes and the massive amount of land loss that is occurring at a rapid pace due to climate change. Um, industrial presence and the outdated levee system. Uh, these are also not my photos. I do want to point out um, the house photo at the top is by Giles Clark. Um, I got the photo of the woman fishing from uh, Big Easy magazine and then this is a satellite image from NASA of the Mississippi Delta, which is also known as a bird's foot, bird's foot delta. And you can... So, uh, of course, uh, during this that I've been in grad school, the pandemic happened, uh, and so everything was put on pause. Um, but I couldn't stop thinking about this one class field trip where we had driven down River Road. It follows the Mississippi River, and I observed plantation ruins and levees, as well as large refineries hovering over homes, schools, and playgrounds. Um, I became really fascinated with this strikingly dangerous landscape, and. Uh, of course, later learned that this area was nicknamed Cancer Alley. Uh, this is also, of course, known as Louisiana's Chemical Corridor. It is an 85 mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge uh, that has been completely overrun with petrochemical industry. Uh, there are over 150 plants now residing here along the Mississippi River. Um, I want to read a couple quotes from a 
book called A Quest for Environmental Justice, Human Rights and the Politics of Pollution. This book is by Robert D. Bullard, in case anyone has any interest in reading. Um, Human slavery spawned environmental racism, becoming the byproduct of race, racial segregation and discrimination in the southern U.S. by Jim Crow laws. The South has always been regarded as backward because of its social, economic, political, and environmental pol policies. The region became an environmental sacrifice zone, a dump for the rest of the nation's toxic waste. Local governments and big business take advantage of people who are politically and economically powerless. This mentality emerged from the region's earlier mar marriage to slavery and the plantation system, exploiting both humans and the land. So the South is characterized by these look the other way environmental policies and uh, giveaway tax breaks. In this book, uh, he called the South the nation's third world, uh, where political bosses encourage outsiders to buy the region's human and natural resources at bargain prices. The air, the ground, and the water along the Mississippi Chemical Corridor were so full of carcinogens that at one point it was described as a massive human experiment. Uh, ever since the EPA introduced the toxic release inventory in 1989, Louisiana has consistently ranked the highest in the nation for toxic environmental releases and waste generation. So although um, Louisiana ranks low in almost all quality of life indicators, uh, most notably education, uh, it does rank first in the nation uh, per capita toxic releases to the environment. So the fall of 2020 semester began and all of this information was uh, in the back of my mind and, and uh, really pretty fresh because I had nothing to do during the pandemic besides read and research. Uh, so the pollution and health risks reminded me actually of sunflower farms planted among sites of nuclear disasters in areas such as Hiroshima, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. The sunflowers are known as hyperaccumulators. Uh, and that's due to their ability to pull contaminants from the ground. The process is called phytoextraction, and it's very popular among ecologists in bioremediation. Um, the oil produced by sunflowers also holds great potential for um, offsetting petroleum diesel use as well and like farming equipment. Um, so the brooch that I created uh, in a small metals class uh, is kind of like a working symbol for the project. It is, um, the project is called the Petro Flower Project, and this is a sunflower growing out of an oil drum surrounded by fumes. So uh, this very large project that I am proposing is a community-involved project uh, along Louisiana's Cancer Alley to stimulate conversation about recalibrating America's uh, economy away from fossil fuels and consideration of our environment and the communities that are exceedingly impacted by the petrochemical industry. The illustration here um, is just one component of the full installation. Uh, the number of oil drums that are on the barge would represent the number of plants along Cancer Alley. I, the main part of the project and what I really hope to do prior to the barge installation is actually work with local activist groups, uh, environmentalists, and individuals to plant sunflowers in the neighborhoods most affected by this industry presence. Um, with the help of volunteers, I'd like to provide sunflowers, uh, seeds, the gardening lessons, and of course all the tools necessary um, for those who are interested in participating. Uh, this is, of course, like I said, an effort to stimulate a larger conversation. It is not a solution. Um, by any means, sunflowers cannot make that much of a difference, but uh, I think they, they hold a really strong symbolic um, representation for unity, uh, especially in this area that is so affected. Uh, so eventually, when we get to the point of planting the sunflower field on the barge, I'd really like for it to um, actually make the 85-mile trek down the Mississippi Park at Baton Rouge, right in front of the Capitol building and uh, just have a stage there for the activist groups to speak their minds about everything that's going on in their neighborhoods. Um, another aspect of the project would be to actually collect the sunflower seeds from the local community, uh, 
from their sunflowers in their yards and kind of package them for sale as petro, uh, petro flower seeds. Uh, and this is just kind of to touch on the conceptual impact of living under these conditions. Would you as an outsider want to eat food grown in an area where people are, are basically trapped because their homes are now 40% the value of what they originally were when they first uh, lived, moved there? Um, but as much as I am thinking about this project um, and uh, working on it, of course, uh, it's not the kind of project that you rush into. It takes a long time um, to build relationships and it involves a lot of collaboration. Uh, and I also uh, think it's important to deeply understand the complexity of these issues and what these communities are facing. So it is a long term project that is slowly, very slowly unfolding over time, but um, I hope to make it happen in the next few years. Uh, during this, um, so I like, I guess I describe myself as a slow multitasker because I work on multiple things at the same time. You'll have to forgive, this uh, is an in-process image. I wasn't able to finish this before I left, but it is, again, from the small metals class, and um, this is, of course, an oil barrel uh, with a refinery on top. The plate shows what will soon be like a pillow of smoke coming out. That is just um, the plate made for the hydraulic press that I'll be using in order to do that. Uh, but the imagery, I think, is nice. Um, of course, this would be also have a patina that's like a really, will be like a dark black patina. Um, and the lid will be able to slide to the side so that uh, you can pull out the sharecropper home that will fit inside along with the sugar cane um, that will be surrounding. That representing what once was uh, prior to industry. And um, there's a really cool patina tactic that you can do with sterling silver that basically pulls out all the copper alloys, creating a really white, ghostly uh, sort of patina. And that's what the silver house and uh, uh, sugar cane will become. Um, it will be soldered onto a plate that will, so as you pull out the oil that I will be filling the barrel with, will kind of drain underneath and you'll, you'll then reveal this, uh, this house. Um, so, uh, because I'm moving into my third and final year of grad school, I spent much of my time here actually researching. Um, and I like to say that I think with my hands sometimes. So, I, you know, going on hikes, it's a great way to think about work that you are, um, kind of walking into and trying to decide what to do. So I just would bring a little sketchbook with me and uh, do a few drawings as I went out. Um, I also started collecting knapweed, uh, which I didn't realize at the time was such an invasive species here, but Carly let me in on that when I brought it all in here at Home Resource. Um, so I just started kind of uh, just collecting things and, and, and also making these 3D wood collages just as I was thinking um, about larger works that I, I'm hoping to create. So uh, going into this year, I am aiming to focus on my kinship with the natural world, and much of that does begin with the sea. Uh, although, uh, I like to say, although I've parted ways with the land, um, I seem to always be pulled back to the study of water like the tide pulls the sand. So much of my identity has been constructed by childhood on the Florida coast. Um, the Atlantic Ocean, the freshwater springs, and brackish waterways are where I learned uh, to plan my day around the tides, identify currents, and read the wind. Uh, this connection is really what first established my interest in environment. Um, and my studio practice thus far is sort of uh, my way of exploring the parameters for the conversation that I do want to have. Uh, so thinking about home and, and identity and roots is where I found this image here. Um, and then this is actually created by the tide uh, pulling out. Um, this is sand imprinted. So I saw a connection there. Uh, and while I was here and now been drawn back to Montana for the third summer, uh, I had to figure out what my tie was here and why do I keep coming back? It's like as far opposite as you can get. 
um, from where I'm from, so, uh, just about. So, uh, of course, I explored many different things. I, when I was started collecting the gnat weed, I really started uh, investigating invasive species and, and could there be a tie there? And, and um, I was eventually led to the Missouri River and um, how that begins here in Montana then leads into the Mississippi, which of course drains into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and something that I noticed in the imagery with, with the river system, with what was created with the tides, thinking about the roots of my identity, uh, was then linking back to this vein exploration I had done in the previous intaglio print. So now I'm thinking about linking veins, what makes us up as humans, uh, the river systems, what we rely on, um, and of course the marsh waterways as you kind of go through with a little John boat for your fishing or whatever. Um, so during my time here, I, I made this maquette, which is on the table here. Uh, this is a maquette for a larger scale work that I would like to do. Um, and what this does is give me the opportunity to switch out what I want to make for the head. Uh, I thought about, I kind of played with holding the nap weed up and like, what does that look like? And, and then there's this relationship between, uh, here's this plant, nap weed, that I didn't know by looking at it was invasive. I have, you know, no background here understanding that. Um, so to me, it didn't look invasive. I just thought it was one of the natural grasses here. If you think about us as humans, we don't really look invasive either, but we are highly invasive to the environment. So what connection um, could I play here? In Louisiana and in Florida, we deal with um, water hyacinth as a very invasive species. It takes over ponds and lakes and riverways, but again, it's actually a beautiful flower and you wouldn't think that it's, it's so bad. Um, so yeah, so that kind of gives me uh, something to play with, uh, and and that's that's where I got with, with that piece. It's a, again, work in progress. So I want to say thank you, and of course I can put a picture of my dog. Uh, this is Opie, <laughs> and I just wanted to also uh, have a few honorable mentions here. The Poor People's Campaign and the Concerned Citizens of St. John's Parish are the people that I'm reaching out to in Louisiana along uh, Cancer Alley. Um, the National Conference of Cast Iron Art and Practices is, that's a, a here um, in the States at Sloss Furnaces uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama. It is uh, so much fun. And that's every two years. The International Conference uh, for Cast Iron Art and Practices is actually happening uh, in Germany. For this next one, that's about every four years. Pandemic kind of changed timing on everything, but um, I'm currently on the board for that and very excited uh, for everything that's going to be happening there. We're going to start rolling out information for that uh, very soon, so be on the lookout for that as well. I also put my website on here and my Instagram. Uh, I'm trying to be better about posting, but I'm not going to make any promises. There will be maybe a couple posts here and then a month or two in between, but. Uh, if you have any interest in the work that I'm doing, uh, you know, I'll try, I'll try. Uh, on the table here, I put some photo references as well as a lot of the books that I've been reading and kind of exploring. Um, I did some of my, I put some, you know, what I was thinking with my hand, those wood 3D collages there. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for coming out. If you have any questions um, or want me to go back to any sites, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank <laughs> you.